Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. First of all, I want to say a profound thank you to our guests. I am speaking to you from Treaty 6 territory in the mountain time zone, and I appreciate for all of our guests that it is very early this morning, and I once again implore my colleagues in Ottawa to think about the width of the country as we are booking our guests. Um, so I want to thank you all, uh, hi hi and Messi Cho, for being with us this morning. I was very taken by something uh, that Ms. Deranger said about having a parallel advisory council made up of, of Indigenous people. And I wanted to ask all three of you about whether you think that that is something that would work even if it weren't written into the language of the act, if you think that having uh, a parallel Indigenous advisory council would underline the government to government relationship uh, between First Nations and the Crown, or whether it would come off as tokenism if there were, um, you know, would it be like sitting at the kids' table at, at Christmas? You want to start by? Uh, well, um, uh, why don't we start with Dr. Sayers and we'll, we'll in, 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 in the order in which they were received this morning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think it would be tokenism. You know, Indigenous peoples across this country have got to be part of a shared decision-making model. And if we structure this right and having input into net zero and how do we achieve that? How do we look specifically at the impacts on our territories and the recommendations that we need? I think that would be one way of being inclusive of Indigenous people. I don't think I mentioned that I thought we should have a specific Indigenous summit every five years. You know, the it's, it's really hard. You know, like you, I think the previous senator asked about, you know, what is it going to be the impacts on our territory? And even in my lifetime, I'm going to say it was a short lifetime, no, <laughs> um, was that um, I have seen amazing amounts of climate change in our territories. And I, you know, I, you know, the question about, you know, how do we, Newtown is supportive of Bill C-15, only because it represents an opportunity to get the government to react quickly. We haven't had a lot of success with Section 35. And so maybe that would give us another tool. And there are many provisions in UNDRIP that would allow us to create those decision-making institutions, that response. And you know, I, I think as Indigenous people, we are experts because we live this every day. And, you know, there's just so many sections in UNDRIP that could cover this. And so I think that um, we have to take opportunities where we can, uh, because this is, this is critical. I mean, you know, it, it, and even just having to get air conditioners for all of our elders where we never had to, just so they could make it through a summer. There's some basic health issues that we face every day. So thank you for your question. And Mr. Mr. Raja. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. Um, um, I think that an, an oversight council of indigenous experts wouldn't be tokenism and I think it would actually add to, but I think it also mustn't, mustn't undermine the fact that the advisory body should still have an indigenous representative. And the reason why an indigenous body, uh, an oversight body would be an important aspect is the fact that there are three distinct groups of Indigenous peoples in this country. We have First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, and a single Indigenous representative cannot represent everyone on the advisory body. But by having an, a, an oversight council, this allows for there to be a more robust process for Indigenous peoples to have oversight and give recommendations and allow those sort of three different groups to be represented and still have input into this net zero count Act. It's really important that there is Indigenous values, um, knowledge systems, and oversight of this bill to ensure that there's meaningful participation in it. And this is just one of the potential processes that could help uh, move us towards that track. And as and as you know, Dr. Sayer said. I myself, um, you know, I'm 42 years old. I have seen in my own lifetime the impacts that climate change has had. I have also seen our communities come up with some of the most amazing and beautiful solutions that are driven from our culture, our identities, and our relationships with the land that are taking our community, my own community, off of diesel, uh, 
food security, energy sovereignty that can be replicated at large if we're given the space to be a part of these conversations in real and meaningful ways. Uh, Chief, is that trend that you want to add? Yes, Masi, again, thank you for the opportunity and for the question. And I would say that uh, this would not be tokenism. Um, there would need to be accountability in the sense that with this uh, overlay committee, um, that the advice and the considerations um, will have to be uh, vetted in a, in a meaningful way by, by the committee. And I, I really want to uh, double down and uh, reiterate um, and, and complement some of the comments we'd heard before. I can tell you unequivocally, 80 miles north of the Arctic Circle, that everything that we can quantify is changing, even to the point where we are now admonishing um, and uh, requesting that pregnant women and young children do not eat the livers of whitefish in our territory, as biomagnification uh, does not enable fish species to release mercury from their bodies, which are now accumulating. But moreover, I hope I helped to paint a picture of our international reach and efforts uh, spanning across the Arctic and right through Canada into Alaska. Our partnerships and our abilities and successes already are are far ahead of um, any government, including our territorial government and with uh, indigenous communities and indigenous governments, we have to understand that decentralization and the empowerment of communities at a micro scale to empower them towards self-determination and self-sustainability even goes into national defense as with our own ability to generate electricity, we no longer rely on the diesel fuel being flown up to our community. And these, although are expensive, and um, in endeavors, that kind of certainty and what we are able to establish and have already established in our community, unlike any other in Canada, but moving with First Nations, sharing and fomenting these abilities um, with the Land Claims Agreement Coalition, which uh, we liaison with the Canadian government as well. I, I cannot stress enough the abundance of knowledge um, as well as coming from a, another spectrum of history and a way of knowing and being in the world. But moreover than that, we understand the power of our partnerships and we're here to empower Canada so that from a macro scale, that the, the movements from the Canadian government can be more deft and articulate with the finesse of complementing our knowledge and direction as holders of uh, this key knowledge, traditional knowledge from our lands, um, going back to before before history, even here in Yukon, um, our language knows as Chukaihan. We have been here for over 30,000 years. Um, so we're in this together, but if our knowledge does not make it into these capacities, uh, we Canada will suffer on a whole. <laughs> 